This morning, um, this morning, uh, if this is your first Sunday here with us, service is going to be a little, a little different in that um, what I, I need to do this morning, and we've been talking about this, is cast vision and to kind of remind you a little bit of, of who restoration is, where restoration is going, why God has us on this corner. So today, uh, the message is not really a message, it's more of a presentation that we have been working together with our board of directors um, and our team to kind of talk about where God has taken the church, what's next for us as a ministry, what we need to do next to get to where God would have us to go. So it's going to be like a fire hydrant. I'll be moving at a rapid pace because I have a lot to present. But I do want to say to you that in, in the next couple of weeks, you will have everything that you see on the screen in a neatly um, com compiled document that you can have for you to read. Um, we'll probably send it electronically in a PDF format, but everybody will have a chance to go through what you're going to see on the screen, plus some more things, because it's pretty much an unfinished product, meaning that our board is still working on financial data and some other strategies on the back end to make our vision uh, become a reality. But I just need to communicate that with you this morning. So if you would give us your attention and be in prayer as we share a little bit. Uh, next week we'll shift gears and kind of come back to our teaching, but today we just need to kind of align with God. Amen? So grab your Bibles and go with me to the book of um, Acts. I will begin there and use that as a foundation to talk through what the Lord is laying. So Acts, um, you can begin at chapter 1. I will walk you through that, and then we'll get to the passage that I want to share in chapter 2 so we can allow God to be God. So let's just look to God for a word of prayer before we get there. If you're in Acts 1, say amen, then we'll pray. Oh, come on, y'all are whispering. Let me, let, you guys all right? Amen. amen. There we go. Amen. Let's pray. Yeah, Lord, we thank you for you. Pray for strength, pray for just guidance, for encouragement as we share um, our vision this morning, Lord, that it would rest on the hearts of people, that we would be motivated, Lord, that we would be encouraged to press on and to be all that you have called us to do. You have uniquely shaped and uniquely called this ministry for a unique place in this metro Denver area. So as we revisit and look at vision again, God, rekindle flame. Bring to memory, Lord, the things that should be deposited there, that you deposited there so we can be about your business. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen, amen. Before we read, um, if you were here at the first part of the year, here's how we started the year. I started with this sermon um, with the theme of start strong, finish strong. You guys remember that? If you were here for the first part of the year. And the gist of what was shared was that pretty much um, if you can be consistent in the first hundred days of the year, the likelihood of you maintaining that energy and making it to the end of the year is pretty high, right? And so we shared some things. I gave you some principles. I gave you some processes to put in place to make sure you, you stay consistent and, and fulfill what you said you're going to do. Now, we are less than 90 days before the end of the year. Can you believe that? Isn't that something? When, when I was a child, I mean, it seems like tomorrow would take forever. Y'all remember that? Now I'm like, slow down. Because the older I get, the faster tomorrow comes. Isn't it? Is it just me, y'all? Yeah, yeah. So here, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. How many of you have already given up on your resolutions that you made at the first part of the year? Yeah, I thought so. Sounds like that's everybody, huh? <laughs> yeah, we say things, we forget things, and we need to be reminded of things. This is one of the reasons we're restating the vision and just kind of wanted to rekindle the flame and let you see what God is saying, where we are, who we said we were going to be as a ministry, and get to where God would have us to be. So I want to look at this passage of Scripture that's in front of us in the book of Acts chapter 2. But before we go to chapter 2, let me give you a little bit of literary context because our vision um, that, that has been the vision of this ministry since day one has not changed over the years, and it is premised in the Bible, specifically what we're going to see in the book of Acts. So when you look at Acts chapter 1, be, um, as you walk through that, Jesus now, just raised from the dead, met with his, with his disciples after his resurrection, and he gave them some specific instructions as he was meeting with them. 
So in chapter 1, around verses uh, 4 through 6, here's what he said to them. He said, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the promised Holy Spirit, which my father said he would send. Now here's what you need to happen to know. A transition now is taking place between when Jesus walked the earth to where he is now going away. So as opposed to leaving his disciples as orphans or without power to do what he want them to do in the earth realm, he says, go to Jerusalem and hang out there until the Holy Spirit comes. Then down in verse 8, he says to them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you're going to be witnesses, okay? Now, I need to say this parenthetically. The purpose for the power of the Holy Spirit was not so they can sing well and have good church and good fellowship and all that good stuff. Even though that may play a role in it, that's not the dominant purpose. The dominant purpose was so they can be witnesses, so they can be martus or martyrs is the Greek word that's used there to say you're going to be different for Christ. And then when you get to, um, what verse is that? Verses uh, chapter 2 over chapter 2, verses 1, you notice the disciples are in the upper room and they're awaiting the descent of the Holy Spirit. Then within those grouping of verses, it says the Holy Spirit came like cloven tongues and landed on all of them. And it says they begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, meaning other languages that they spoke. Verses 5 through 13 is real interesting of chapter 2 because it says that there happened to be some God-fearing Jews that were present at the time that the apostles were speaking in tongues and they thought they were drunk. Now, I like that verse because they said these men must be crazy because listening to what they're doing and looking what's happening to them. Now, the reason I like that is I'm one of those guys that will say to you, I think when the city looks into the church, we ought to be so radical for Christ that they think we're crazy. Oh, come on, say amen. Yeah. See, the church, the church has become too conservative and we fit in too easily. I'm not saying that we need to be weird, but we ought to be so sold out for Jesus that we're having an impact. Come on, somebody say amen on that. So that's what happened. Then when you get to around verses 14, um, Peter now starts to explain to the crowd what's happening and what he was really saying, what, you ex what you're experiencing here in Jerusalem is what Jesus prophesied would happen, and you're seeing the manifestation now of what happens when a church, when an individual becomes possessed or filled with the Holy Spirit. He delivered this, this God-bearing, powerful message which resulted in about approximately 3,000 or more individuals giving their life to Christ. And then we get to chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, and go over there. I want to pick up there and read. And we start to see now him explaining what happened after these individuals came to God. So if you're in verse 42, say amen so I could know you're there. Notice what verse 42 says. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers. And it says, And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings or goods and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And it says, Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, it says, day by day, those who were being saved. Now, the reason I like this passage so much is because this verse is the basis for the vision that God has given us as a ministry. And basically, our vision says this, is to establish a ministry that ministers, and I'm going to use the word holistically, to the complete person, mind, body, and spirit. The vision for Restoration Christian Fellowship is that as our vision, we look like this church did in the book of Acts. I have, I have in my hand a page from my manuscript from the first sermon that I preached when we launched Restoration Christian Fellowship 
February 21st, 1999. And I wanted to take a brief moment to read that vision statement to you because the vision statement remains the same. And I want you to begin to see that it was birthed out of this passage of Scripture that's in front of us. Here's what it says. Our vision is to reach Metro Denver with the love of God, breaking down racial, cultural, and denominational walls of religion, and create a place where everyone is welcome and afforded an opportunity to belong to the family of God. It includes creating a place where the hurting, the depressed, the frustrated, and the confused can find love, acceptance, help, hope, forgiveness, guidance, and encouragement. It includes building a bridge from the church to the community and the community to the church through healthy relationships with God. It includes spreading the love of God by serving the community, resulting in solutions being provided to families faced with the challenges of today's society. Our vision is to create jobs and ministry opportunities by providing programs of employment, empowerment, entrepreneurial training, and assistance for single parents and low-income families. It includes providing counseling to individuals and families who are dealing with abusive relationships, substance abuse, and basic dysfunctional issues in the home. It includes providing financial and social counseling to lead the residents of our community towards self-sufficiency. It includes providing food, clothing, and other social and human needs to residents in the community. Our vision is to be a working liaison between the community and other institutions of higher learning to provide educational opportunities to residents who would not otherwise be afforded such opportunities. It is to provide computer skills and job enhancement training. It is to serve as a business incubation hub to enhance the entrepreneurial skills of those with a desire to start a business but lack the wherewithal to proceed. Our vision is to provide educational opportunities that enhances the academic skills of our children. It is to provide after school and summer programming to prepare our children and youth to excel and compete academically. It is to partner with law enforcement, civic organizations, and business owners to provide training and programs to eliminate crime in our neighborhoods. It is to provide opportunities for children and youth of low-income families to be mentored to deal with difficulties in life. Our vision is an agenda for restoration. Our vision will come to pass, and it says it is from God. Come on, say amen. Amen, amen. It's all right. Come on, amen. And, and I, want you, I want you to hear that because when you look at the book of Acts, you see what was modeled in Acts with these, these bodies of believers not having needs among themselves, them having community impact, and everything that was going on there, I really believe, and we really believe, that's what God has called us to do. So what we did by way of a strategy several years ago was to launch what we call Double Vision and what Double Vision was, it's, it's our 10-year strategy to move our vision from infancy to maturity. In other words, we have this vision and we're saying, how do we get from here to there? So we begin the process of putting some intentional steps to get to where we needed to go. So what Double Vision says, the goal was to create a literal community where people can experience and live out the kingdom principles in heaven, where Matthew 6 says... Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done where? On earth, how? As it is in heaven. So we're one of those ministries that don't want you to wait till you get to heaven to enjoy God. You ought to enjoy him right now. Come on. We ought to reap the benefits of, amen, amen, of what God for has right now. So whatever God's will is, um, we want it done on earth, how it is in heaven. So we put this thing in together that said, in the first five years of Double Vision, we want to be fully functional in five and in the second five years, you want to be fully facilitated. As you can look at the dates on the screen, you can see that we're not where we needed to be um, and that we're a little behind schedule. So this is why we want to have this conversation to talk about this today. Here's what fully functional in five meant. Within the first year, five years of releasing Double Vision, what we wanted to do is within those first five years, you wanted to have successfully launched, we call them the six operating centers of Double Vision. What that meant is within the first five years, we hoped to have been positioned where we are meeting the holistic needs of people 
within the Aurora community. For example, we wanted to have our event center going, um, our school up and running. We wanted to have our enterprise center where we're creating jobs and meeting the vocational needs of people. We wanted to have our recreational facility going, Operation Nehemiah. Uh, we wanted to have that fully run, running, meeting social needs. And of course, the ministry, the church itself, doing everything that it said it was going to be. So fully functional in five meant within the first five years, those things would be fully operational, fully staffed, with business plans, with strategies for sustainability, and all that stuff, and we're having impact within the community. When we talk about being fully facilitated in 10, what we meant was the second half of Double Vision, um, if I could use this term, we would be there as it relates to facility. I don't know if you know this, but when you come to our campus, all the vacant land that's around this facility belongs to Restoration Christian Fellowship. Come on, y'all. Amen. 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 And, and we were hoping to have completely developed that out um, by the year 2021. And as you can tell, being 2017, we're a little behind the curve. And so we need to talk about what a recovery strategy is and how do we get to where we need to go. So when we said fully functional, we're talking about our event center, um, educational space in place, our enterprise space, social service place, gymnasium, and workspace, and all the stuff that's necessary to get us to where we need to go is, should be in place in the second half of Double Vision. What you need to know about that is even though we may be behind, God is still on time. Come on, y'all. Yeah, yeah. You know, even though as a people, we may be a little behind, God is still what? On time. Here, here, here let me explain what I mean by that. We, we have part of our vision path to build our own gymnasium and, and to have our own recreational facility and so on and so forth. Well, those of you that know anything about Inspire Fitness down at the end of the way down there, um, right on time, God allowed them to come in and create our fitness facility. Y'all not hearing me. Come on, right in our campus. You see how God does what God's going to do, right? And I say this all the time. The issue is never God. It's always us. We're the ones that are a little bit behind because maybe we don't believe God the way we should. So the question is, what have, what have we accomplished so far? Currently, we have about four of our six ministry areas operational with limited effectiveness is what I'm going to say. If you don't know, Restoration Christian Academy is up and running. It exists uh, in the facilities across the way. If you haven't seen it, you might want to go there. Beautiful Christian school. Um, state Credential doing quite well. Um, we currently are purchasing the facility within which we're at. Um, so this belongs to us. And we have the option to purchase the remaining shopping center. First right of refusal there. And I love this part because I said it earlier. God has already blessed. Okay, y'all, come on, y'all. He's already blessed. God, God has already been doing his part. The issue is not God, it's us. Here's what we did a couple of years ago, several years ago, we launched the I'm In campaign. Most of you would remember that, where we received pledges and contributions from all people like yourself that were committed to the ministry, and you gave us a, a good bit of resources. I believe the numbers were around 300,000, and what the monies were used for were create more effective youth and children's ministry. Um, we were able to do renovations in the children's ministry area. If you go back there, you see some things are still down because we're trying to finalize that. But more importantly, if you go down the end of the center, you'll see a beautifully renovated room where we do child, uh, youth ministry on Wednesday night, and we're trying to fix all of that. I'll talk about that in a little while to kind of get to where God would have us to go. Here's the kicker about the youth space, right? You go in that room. It's a beautiful room, about 3,000 square feet, I think it is. Um, Beautiful chairs, beautiful carpet, beautiful sound system, beautiful walls, beautiful everything. And once again, we didn't pay a dime to get it done. I'm going to say it again. God is holding up his end of the deal. The issue is not God, right? Because I'm crazy enough and we're crazy enough to believe that God has given us this vision. So we must get it done. Here's some things we've done as we paid off some outstanding tax bill that we had on the worship facility, 
paid off taxes on the donated property. Um, Our school has been renovated, and recently this year, we were able to hire an administrative pastor, praise the Lord, full-time, who has come on board, and she is working herself a little too hard. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But, but God, God, God is doing his part, and the issue is not God. The issue is us. So I'm going to say to you, to date, though, to date, we have not yet re- 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 achieved the status where we can honestly say we're fully functional in five um, because yet and still we are not, we don't have a major presence in the Aurora and the Denver community and when you look around what's happening here, we're not having a community impact that we, the way we should. So the question must be raised, if our vision is birthed out of Acts chapter 2, what are we missing or where do we go wrong? What's, what's happening and what do we need to do to begin the process of turning this thing around? So go back with me to Acts chapter 2. Grab your Bibles again. Open it to Acts chapter 2 and jump down to verse 42. And then we're going to talk through this. And I want to point out some things in Scripture so we can see what God is saying. Let me know if you're there by saying amen. 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 Let me read verse 42 again. Notice what it says. It opens up by saying, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And verse 43 says, All came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as anyone, as any had need. Verse 46 says, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Verse 47 says, praising God and having favor with all the people. And I love this. And the Lord, when they were doing those things, and the Lord added to their number daily or day by day those who were being saved. Seems to me that if we're going to be a church that's patterned after the book of Acts, or at least said that's the core that says what we need to look like as it relates to the New Testament church, if we're doing what 42 through 46 says, 47 should be the result. We should have community impact, and we should see growth as it relates to what God is saying. So as we look at these, this passage of Scripture in front of us, there's a couple of things that I want to point out from the text itself. Number one, when you study this passage, these individuals lived, first of all, in community with each other. 3,000 plus people, and God was continually adding to their number. And I don't want you to visualize so much a big, large community consisting of 3,000 people, but I want you to see them understanding how to live in community by forming what I'm going to refer to as community groups. They lived in groups together in that early day and age. So here's the results. Because they lived in community What Living Community did, number one, or A, was that it gave them a place to belong. Interestingly. Come on, say amen. It gave them a place to belong. And how do you know that, preacher? Because look at verse 42. It says, they were devoted to the fellowship. That Greek word, koinonia. They had relationship. They had intimacy. They had connection. They hung out together, right? It says they met continually in the temple courts, meaning what? That not only did they meet in their homes in groups, but are they devoted to fellowshipping with each other, but worship was an integral part of what they did as a community. I love the last one. It says they broke bread in their homes. Every football season, they'd go to somebody's house and watch the Broncos lose. I mean, they just, no, no, that's one way, no, I'm just kidding. I get in trouble for that. But, but, but they broke bread in their homes. Imagine that, right? Coming together, fellowshipping, watching Dallas, what do what Dallas is going to do every week. Come on, isn't that, isn't that, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. they didn't watch Dallas? Yeah, they did. That's America, that's God's team. Y'all just didn't know that. Yeah, that's good. yeah. So, so they would go to their homes. They would go to the homes and they would pray and eat and say, Lord, let Dallas win this week. You know, 
That, I mean, they broke, I found that amazing that they had a place to belong. But not only did they have a place to belong, look at the text. It says, while living in community in Acts, they were taught to believe. How do you know that, preacher? Look at the text. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. Verse 42. They prayed together. Verse 42. Miraculous signs, it says, were done by the apostles. In other words, they witnessed the miraculous power of God. They witnessed the hand of God in their midst. They saw the sick being healed. They saw the lame being walked. They saw miracles happening and that grew them to a place where their belief in God grew deeper. Don't you think if the community in the world can see people getting healed that they'd want to know God? Oh, come on, say amen. Don't you think if the community saw the miraculous, saw the hand of God moving in this place, that they would want to be a part of it themselves? That pressed the issue of belief, and they grew deeper in Christ. Here's the third thing they did while living in community. They grew to behave. They had a connection point where they belong. They grew deep where they believe. And then watch this. They grew to behave like Christ. Look at their behavior. They sold their possessions and gave to each other. Now, don't make the mistake of thinking that the text is only speaking about people within their community because the reason the community was filled with awe by what was happening is because they were meeting the needs of the community as well. I want you all to hear me say that. They, they belong, they believe, and then they behave. Part of their behavior was that they were impacting the community. Imagine what this community looked like. Let me try to make this relevant to today. Imagine that, that somebody in the community had a problem in their home. Let's say it's a single mother, and then they had these groups in their community. Let's say it's a construction worker, and all the construction workers together that belong to this group and believe in God, their behavior was that they would go out out and fix that person's house by way of their ministry for little or nothing to be a blessing. Don't you think that person would want to know God? Oh, come on, come on. I want to imagine, imagine all the physicians or the medical people that were part of this Christian community formed a group where they belong. Then they grew to behave because they'd get together to pray and to study the word. And people in their midst and people in the community that didn't have medical insurance, imagine the church providing wellness care for the community. If that happened, don't you think they'd want to belong? Come on, y'all not hearing me. Imagine, imagine, imagine that all the mechanics in the church group, they got together and formed a community group. They created a place for the mechanics to belong and they got together and prayed and they studied the word and they believed and the behavior was this. Every single mom that needed an oil change, y'all not hearing me, the group would go out and change not only the oil for the single women, but they would extend it to the community and if that happened, don't you think the community would want to belong? I wish I had somebody in here. But if we fool ourselves into thinking the purpose of the Holy Spirit is just to have the church, we will miss having community impact because we won't see ourselves as the ministers of the gospel called to go out and to spread the word. And this is parenthetic. This is free because a lot of us think evangelism is about saying. I want to challenge you. Could it be also about doing I think one time Jesus was walking by a funeral possession, and the text does not say he opened up his Bible and quoted scripture. He just did. He reached over and touched the coffin and says, young man, I say to you, get up. Come on. Y'all not hearing me. One time the woman of Nain and the woman with the issue of blood, it's not about him saying, it's about doing. And we might preach a more effective gospel if our community can see us doing more than we say. The problem is we say and our action does not align with what we say. We should probably do more. Are you hearing me? They had places to belong. They were taught to believe. And their behavior also aligned. So watch this as I'm almost there. So number one, they lived in community. They were witnesses. I talked about that. They had community impact. And number three, the result of this was this. Believers were having such impact that it resulted in numerical growth. If you're out... Folk will come in. Uh, where you go to church again? 
Y'all pay people's rent there? Please, I'm four months behind. Yeah. <laughs> They'll come. Come on. You help people with groceries there? What? You mean you, you meant, really? A church does that? You, you provide training for people that don't have skills? You help people find jobs? Heck, you help them start businesses? Where is this again? Here's what the church says. When you get to heaven, that'll happen. God says, your kingdom come, your will be done. Yeah, y'all get it. Y'all get it. Amen. Amen. So very, very important that we miss that. But the problem with us as a ministry is we're not there yet. And I'm the one that's going to raise the question, what's the problem? What's the challenge? What do we need to get there? And so if we're going to get there, change, change must take place in Restoration Christian Fellowship. I know change is a scary word around here. But I'm one of those guys that's comfortable saying to you, God is a God of change. He is. He's a God of change. Um, he, he, let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, one scripture says it this way. Speaking to myself, I once was young. And when I was a boy, I acted like a child. I thought like a child. I behaved like a child. But then watch the change. But when I became a man, I did what? Put away. Yeah, yeah. So it seems, it seems that over the course of my life, every day was a change process. Okay? Now here's the depth of this. Every day I change a little, resulting in who I am today. So it seems to imply when it comes to the issue of change, that change must constantly be made. We must constantly make change to achieve perfection or to realize the vision that God has given us. Let me give you an illustration of this. Um, the majority of you in here are Bronco fans, right? Here, here's what this looks like. Every year, every year, John Elway and the coaching staff and management and owners for the Broncos, here's what they do. In the off season, they sit down and here's what they say. How can we refine the team? How can we change the team to make it better? How can we make it more effective? So here's what it looked like in the offseason. They'll swap players and bring in new players, and they do all kinds of stuff, swap positions and bring in new positions. And the reason they continually make change to the team is because the goal of the change, the result is they want to consistently win the Super Bowl. Come on, y'all. Are you with me? So they make change every single time to win the Super Bowl. God's church is no different. So if we say we're going to set out to do, and we notice we're not getting there, doing the same thing, hoping to see different results, is called what? Yeah, you know it. Change must happen. So here's what this formula said. It's something I did with my doctoral thesis. Change happens when there's a level of dissatisfaction in the organization. There must be a clearly defined vision. That's the V. The F means there must be clearly articulated first steps, and all of that must be greater than the level of resistance that exists within the organization. If you can do those things, you can get to change. Here's a case in point of that working. We started this ministry about 18 years ago. We started down on Colfax, on the corner of um, Emporia and Colfax, and the ministry you see today is not the same ministry that started with the same 20 people on Colfax. We had to keep changing and keep molding to get to where we need to go. So the point is, we must go through something to get to where God would have us to go. So the issue then becomes, what then is the recovery strategy, and what are we going to do differently so we can make sure we get to where we're going to go? Here's what that looks like. So addressing the D first, which is the dissatisfaction, this is where the survey came in. We conducted the survey so we can hear from the congregation What's going on? What's happening? What do we need to fix? What's not working well? What do we need to tweak? And, and you'll get a more uh, detailed report in, in the brochure in the upcoming weeks that talks about that. These are the six areas that we identified that seems to be problematic within the ministry. Uh, the worship team rose to the, uh, worship rose to the top. Now, don't, don't make the mistake of thinking that, you know, the music don't sound good, the music isn't good. Worship means a lot more. Does that make sense? There's a lot more that's buried within that, and your comments and feedback brought clarity to a lot of what that means. Um, with the millennials, we, we're not doing well with millennials. I think this service has a lot more millennials in it, but first service, there's not that many millennials. We do not have an effective young adult ministry, so the young people are saying, there's nothing there for me. Make sense? We have to address that. 
our children's ministry. We know we're not doing a good job with it, so you're going to see a brief announcement afterwards. We're trying to fix that. Community involvement or presence, we're not present in the community. Does that make sense? Come on, y'all. I mean, all you need to do is do a self-evaluation. When was the last time I myself as a member went and served my community? Don't say when last time pastor went. <laughs> All right? So you see we're not there. Uh, church leadership and what that meant by church leadership, uh, what the, the comments are really saying is that we need to have better opportunities to improve on the leadership, meaning giving more others and different people better leader opportunity, leadership opportunities. Because here's what that means. Some of the best leaders in the ministry are still sitting out here. Oh, come on, y'all. You're the managers and the business owners. You're the corporate executives, and look at where you're at. I'm just the preacher. If we're going to achieve this vision, the church needs you to lead. Come on, y'all. It needs you. It needs you. It needs you to execute those skills. Um, last things real quick, and women's ministry, and what that is saying is that our women are really saying that, that, they're, that, that they're hurting, and, and where this data came from, we had 74% of the survey takers being women, 24 being men. So they basically voiced their concerns saying that they're hurting, they're going through things that they need to get to where God would have them to go. Importantly for you not to miss is our mission statement is consistent. It stays the same. And I'm going to hurry on through this. Here's what the mission statement says. That we exist to create places for people to belong, to teach them to believe in God, and to grow them to behave like Christ. Hence you see the mission on the belong the, be the believe and the behave. So what we need to do differently is somehow we need to figure out as a recovery strategy to, to create movement, in other words, to keep moving in the direction of God by doing these three things. Number one, removing congestion, um, establishing alignment by maximizing the energy of every person in the congregation. Let me illustrate what I mean by that. I'm going to stick with my Barnco um, illustration because I want you all to like me today. Um, <laughs> Everyone in the Bronco organization, the only reason they're on that organization is not for Dallas to win. They're on that team because they want the Broncos to win. Come on, y'all. The soup. So, I mean, the janitors, the, the water boy, everybody, the everybody's on that team because they want the team to win. So here's what we do. We've got to get to a place where as an organization, every person that's a member of this organization or attended, the reason you sign up is because you want us to win. Come on, y'all, talk to me. And, and, and if that doesn't become a priority for us, we won't create the movement that's necessary because you're going to have people pulling in a different direction. So we got a line, okay? And so here's the next thing, focus. The goal is the Super Bowl. The goal is the city. The goal is to lead people to Christ. So we must create focus. And what that means, saying no to anything that does not align with creating places to belong, teaching them to believe, and growing them to behave. So in other words, if we're saying we're a football team and someone says, let's go play or join a baseball league, we ought to say, no, we're not a baseball team. We're a football team. Does that make sense? Focus. Come on, say focus. Come on, say like you mean it. Say focus. So here's what that means. Let me read this to you. To enforce these four steps, a simple process is needed that, in, that enforces clarity and places the ministry on a trajectory toward the vision. The process is defined as our discipleship process. So here's what we look to do. We plan to simplify discipleship by combining our mission and our strategy and making them one. I will explain that. So our purpose now must become our process. I'll explain that, okay? So at RCF, we restore people to Christ when we create places for them to belong, we teach them to believe in God, and we grow them to behave. And this is accomplished by moving people through what we call a three-tiered circle of growth where, growth, where each iteration of the circle grows people deeper in Christ, okay? I didn't do a good job explaining this first circuit I'll, service. I'll try to do a little, a little better. So, so let me walk you through this, then I'll give you an illustration. So here's what we're looking to do. Number one, mission, strategy, purpose, all the same. We exist to create places to belong. So what that means, belonging, you, you connect with, with these groups, you put people in community groups, they have a place where they can identify, a place where they can belong, a place where they can connect, and that's the beginning of the discipleship process. 
once they belong to groups, we teach them to believe in God. In other words, to grow deeper by having a working knowledge of the Word of God, of the things of God, and they start to move to having Christ-like maturity. And then the third step is we teach them to use their God-given gifts and ability to serve each other and the community, okay? We create places for people to belong, we teach them to believe, and we grow them to behave in God. Now here's what that looks like, and I'll illustrate. The main objective of the circle of growth is to press the issue of alignment and focus on the main thing as a ministry, making disciples. Come on, say making disciples. Now let me explain this one. So as, a mis- as the mission is being executed, vision is being realized. Okay, let me, let, me, let, me, let me go here. Jeff likes to work out, and I'm kind of envious of his shoulders. Yeah. My wife be on Facebook, dang, look at Jeff's shoulders. And I get in front of her computer, and I be buffing up. And she still says, look at Jeff's shoulders. <laughs> so I'm trying to get shoulders like Jeff so she can look at mine. Okay, but here's the point of the illustration. As the mission is being executed, vision is being realized. So here's what that happens. Every time Jeff goes in the gym and does this, is that what you do for shoulders? Or whatever you do, I don't care. Okay, because <laughs> I'm a hater right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so whatever he does, as he's executing the, 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 the mission, the vision is being realized. Does that make sense? As he's doing mission, whatever it is he does, I don't know, vision is being realized. So without mission, no vision. Right? So here's the thing we'll be saying. If we're saying our mission is to create places to belong, teach people to believe, and grow them to behave like Christ, let's say, here's my illustration again. A person has a, a mechanical gifting. They form a group where all the mechanics can belong. Does that make sense? Are you with me? They meet together to believe. They grow deeper in Christ. And watch this. And they behave by serving each other and the community. And as people rise to the occasion to say, I have this gift, I have this calling, I have this ability, and like-minded people come together and do the mission which they like in themselves and in the community, vision is realized. Does that make sense? One thing, one process, and we work it. Now, here's the thing. Notice what I says. Every iteration around the circle grows you deeper. What do I mean by that? Because when you go out to serve, you're going to encounter something that you weren't prepared for. And the next time you're going to come in and meet, you're going to come in and pray, and then you're going to go, go again. The longer you do that, the deeper you grow in Christ. I want you all to hear me say that. And growth comes by serving. Does that make sense? Come on, say amen if you're tracking with me. A couple more things and I'm almost done. So when you compare what I'm saying to the book of Acts, here's what you see. They were a people devoted to the teaching of the apostles. They were a people devoted to fellowship. They were a people devoted to prayer, devoted to worship, serving each other in the community, and listen to the results. Growth by default. Does that make sense? So here's what that looks like. Let me read this and then we'll talk through this. So for this strategy to be effective as a church, we have to change some things. We have to become a ministry of community groups rather than a ministry with community groups, which means every ministry function in NRCF must operate as a community group, creating places to belong, teaching people to believe, growing them to behave like Christ. So here's what this looks like when we're there. Five years from now, we adopt this strategy where the process leads the vision or the mission is the vision. Here's what we see five years from now. Five years from now, we will see 150 leaders mobilized throughout Metro Denver, leading missional communities of eight to ten people, creating inviting places where people can belong to the family of God, taught to believe in God, and be trained to behave like Christ. We see these pioneers impact in community such that the hurting, the depressed, the frustrated, the confused can find love, help, hope, forgiveness, guidance, and encouragement, resulting in an increase of 1,200 to 1,500 in our weekend worship experience, of which the measure of effectiveness is the number of new leaders deployed annually to make disciples for Christ. That's huge. Because what that's saying is that our vision 
is to, the strategy for the next five years is to raise up leaders who will lead groups in our community. And imagine each, if each person in here in the next five years lead 10 people to Jesus. Come on, y'all. When you get to heaven, your crown's going to be so big. Y'all not hearing me. It's going to, come on, y'all. We won't have room enough to do what God has called us to do. Don't panic on me. Don't freak out. I don't know what to do that. Belong, believe, and behave. And watch what God's going to do. Here's year one. Then I'm going to stop in a little bit. Here's what year one looks like. So in one year, next year, this upcoming year, what you're going to see around here, we will transition from a team of bivocational leaders to full-time staff in all top-level positions and adopt a leadership development process to raise and release 22 new leaders who will launch community groups to mobilize, notice the numbers, 80% of our congregation and 90% of our youth to serve each other and the community, and we will establish consistent, deliberate mechanisms to communicate status updates relating to progress of the vision and the finances of the ministry. Here's what that says. Year one, we have to make the shift from being volunteer-led to staff-led. This is what I mean by that. Come on, worship team. I want a couple more things, and we'll be done. It's difficult to do ministry now when people get off work and we're calling ourselves a major ministry that's having impact. We need staff. We need staff. We need to have the right individuals on the ground doing the right things so we can get to where God would have us to do. Reporting and accountability is very, very important. So here's what this looks like. Here's how we're going to measure success. The number of leaders raised and released to serve in ministry. We should have more of those. The number of conversions. I mean, we are here to save the lost, right? The number of people being rededicated to Christ and the number of people who are being baptized. There should not be a month that go by where this ministry is not baptizing people. Come on, say amen. A month should not go by because that's what we exist. So here's what you need to do. We can invite our church to commit to fasting and prayer. We need more time praying. We need more time seeing God. Uh, a commitment to give in. It's going to take resources to make it happen. And a commitment to align with the vision of the ministry. Alignment is paramount. Alignment is paramount. Let me read this slide and I'll make some comment and I want you to watch this video. Here's what the scripture says in Corinthians chapter 2. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But I love verse 10. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. It was Martin Luther King when he saw the end of the civil rights movements in the midst of what was not yet. Here's what he said. I've been to the mountaintop and I've seen. And he's quoted it this way. I've seen the day when little black boys will be playing with little uh, white boys and little black girls with white girls. And in his day and time, people said that will never happen. But he saw it happen. I see this vision being realized. Here's what this looks like, and I'm going to share. Come on, worship team, y'all come on. I want y'all to watch this video in a little while. I remember the day, I remember the day when we first started this ministry many, many years ago uh, on the street of Colfax. God gave us this vision. And as a result, we moved from there. We grew. We moved to Norfolk. We were on Norfolk Street. We built out that facility, put some $300,000 worth of work in that facility to build it out outgrew it. God said, move. We moved, came um, out. We went in the wilderness for a little while such that we ended up um, setting up a tent in the parking lot of this facility. Y'all remember that? Come on, y'all. A parking lot, a tent in the parking lot of that fa this facility. But here's what the reason we did that. We had some gentleman that we shared the vision with that believed so much in the vision that he went to the owner of this facility and gave him, I think it was over $10,000 in a check, and said, I believe in these people. I want you to let them in. Gave the money. So we're setting up this tent, having service out in the parking lot, and then the owner for the shopping center comes by, and then he says, what is this crazy group of people having church in a tent in a parking lot? I've never seen such craziness. But here's what he did. He went home and got the deed to all the vacant property around here, $2.3 million. And he said, if you're all that crazy, you must believe in what you're doing. And he gave it all to us. 
Are you with me? Okay. That's favor. So here's what I'm saying. God is doing his part to make sure this vision gets realized. We go to city council because now we're in the place. And it was a business center, so that means rezoning needs to take place. So back in the days of the ministry, we had to draw plans, submit everything to city council, and we go to city council. And interestingly enough, that day, they are rejecting every single proposal that comes before them. I kid you not. So the church is in the courtroom, and I'm reaching back. Y'all pray. They turning people down. They ain't approving nobody. And the church just got to praying. Then check this out. Then our proposal gets before the city council, and they call their little huddle. They said, Pastor Gilbert, come on up here. I go up there to ask a couple of questions. And then they said, we unanimously vote to approve what you want to do in Aurora unanimously. Needless to say, it got, a little, it got a little ugly up in there. Little Holy Spirit feel, hey! You know, and the poor judge, order in the court, says, excuse me, sir, we have reason. Hey! You know, and then here's the interesting thing that he said. We believe so much in what you all are going to do. We have one question for you. One question they ask. One question throughout that whole proceeding. Here's the question. How long will it take you to get done? because our city needs this. One question. The issue's not God. God needs his people to align and come together. I want you to wrap your heads around this vid little video that I want to show you of where we believe God has taken us that we show to city officials. So team, y'all put that up on the screen and show this. This is where we're going, y'all. This is this property redone. This is our facility that God has given us to do right here on this corner of six and chambers. Plans are drawn, mock-ups are made. The city of Aurora has completely approved this, rezoned it 100%. That's God doing. That's our facility that seats about 3,500. That's the gymnasium you're looking on the bottom with the amphitheater, youth center. Isn't that something? Come on, y'all. That's beautiful. What God, that thing just sparks up something in me that I'm like, yeah, Lord. You know, I mean, it's a Canaan where there's large pomegranates and great. The red roof buildings is where we are right now. That, you can see the playground on the side converted to our educational facility. Don't tell me what God can't do. <laughs> Don't tell me what God can't do. Uh, we had an architect come in all the way from California to take one look at this place, and he says, I believe God's going to do this. And this is what this looks like with a rendition of all the work. So this shop, this piece of place that looks like it isn't nothing, you see why the city of Aurora says, when is it going to get done? And it's almost as if they were saying, we believe God with you. <laughs> And you wonder why now we partner with police officials? It's because they've seen this. Civic officials and mayors is because they've seen this. And they too believe that God can do what God said he's going to do. Imagine driving up on a weekly basis to this. Isn't it something? This gives you a re... Come on, y'all. Amen. Come on. Imagine. 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 It's a place where Aurora can be proud and our city can be proud and we can establish legacy to say we believe God. Did y'all see my parking spot? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, amen. But God is able. God can do what he said he's going to do. I'm going to invite you to have a little bit of patience with us. Pastor Derek, I'm going to invite you to come and lead us in a time of prayer. Then Pastor Katani is going to come and receive our offering and give God the glory. Come on, y'all. Let's just give God, give God a praise. Give God. Come on. We can do better than that. We get, yeah, amen. God will do what he said he will do. Amen. Amen. Bless your brother. Can I invite you guys, uh, everybody, to stand on their feet for yeah. me, please? Bless you, man. Bless you. And uh, if you would just join me yeah. in stretching your arms out to this man of God and this woman of God. Amen. 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 As we pray for this vision. Yeah, bless this morning. you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord God, for bless the you. vision that you have given Pastor Felix Gilbert and Kentani Gilbert, Lord God, that it's not just about them, Lord God, but yeah. the vision flows through them. Yes. 
So we come together this morning, Lord God, maybe even a little overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah. But it wouldn't be vision, Lord God, if, That's right. if it wasn't going to be a struggle to get there. Yes. So I ask for you to align all of your people right now here today, Lord God, that we endeavor to do something great for you, Father God. Yeah that we get out of our comfort zones and the leaders that are sitting in the pews today, Lord God, mm. recognize where they can fit into the process, Father God. So we just call your name, Lord God, because it will not be done without you. So Father God, let us band together as brothers, Lord God, as we uh, put it on our minds, Lord God, to feed those that yes, need to Lord. be fed, to clothe those that need yeah. to be clothed, Lord God. Yes, Lord. To provide shelter to those that need shelter, Lord God. To provide employment opportunities, Lord God, to those that need employment. Let us be different. Let us do ministry in a different way, Father God. So, Father God, I ask for all of us, Lord God, to get that buzz, to get that feel, Lord God. To say, this is what legacy means, that we can pass it on to our children's children, children, that we can own this peace, Lord God, and allow the people to prosper from it. But it's all about you, Father God. And I know Pastor would have me say this. It's not about them. That's right. That's it's right. about realizing vision. Yes. It's about realizing that we can do something to help someone else. Yes. It's not about greed, yes. but it's about seeing a youth center there that youth can come into a center, Lord, and say it's theirs and participate and build up a school, Lord God, a Christian school that provides those felt needs that we all need. So, Father God, I just praise you today, Lord God. Let us do the things that you've called us to do. Let us stand up and be bold for the things yes. that you've called us to do so that we can make an imprint on this city, on this state, on this community. So I follow you, Father God. Yes, Lord Jesus. And I hope those of you that are out under the sound of my voice, whether you're in the pews today or on the internet, that you would band with us to follow God as we follow, as, as Pastor Felix and Pastor Katani follow him. So we praise your holy name and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.